Uh, I thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm a little amazed because uh, there were several speakers on other panels that I wanted to hear right now, and I thought you would too, but um, thank you all for being here. Um, I want to, last year I gave sort of a pep talk on why uh, cap and trade wasn't going anywhere and why the really the only remaining push behind it was big business. Uh, and I think the year before I gave a talk kind of on uh, the background of, of uh, how we got to where we were. Uh, this year I want to talk about something, something else, which is, um, I'm not sure it's entirely, uh, will be entirely welcome to you, or, and, and I would invite your uh, discussion and criticism of it because you may disagree with some of it. Um, let me just say I have a handout, and the handout uh, starts with the Cooler Heads Digest, which uh, CEI puts out on behalf of the Cooler Heads Coalition every week. It's, a, a, it's an email newsletter. Uh, it's mostly concerned with the politics, although we discuss things like climate gate and uh, uh, scientific, uh, important scientific things that come up. But it's a kind of weekly digest of some news articles and analysis of what's going on in Washington. And you can subscribe to it. And I will, I have a handout, and I will hand it out uh, after I talk. Uh, but you may subscribe to it at globalwarming.org, which is the, uh, the website of the Cooler Heads Coalition. Now, Uh, Mike, you didn't tell me how I moved the space bar. the space bar. Thank you. Uh, now, here's here's Art Robinson. He's recently published an article by uh, uh, with SPPI, Bob Ferguson's group, how government corrupts science. And I think we're probably all fairly uh, uh, happy to think that that uh, government corrupts science. I certainly think it corrupts science. Um, the left also agree with this. Here's a recent book by John Grant, Corrupted Science, Fraud, Ideology, and Politics in Science. Uh, three examples he gives are Hitler's racist, r racial science, Stalin's Lysenkoism, and Bush's climate science. Uh, president Eisenhower agreed, former President Dwight D. Eisenhower, in his farewell address, which was televised on January 17, 1961. He spoke of two threats to our governmental arrangements. One was uh, well known, it's become very famous, the military industrial complex. The other was uh, what I would call the scientific bureaucratic complex. Uh, he said that um, a steadily increasing share of science is conducted for, by, or at the direction of the federal government, today the solitary inventor, Tinkering in his shop has been overshadowed by task forces of scientists in laboratories and testing fields. In the same fashion, the free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research. Partly because of the huge costs involved, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. For every old blackboard, there are now hundreds of new electronic computers. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. And I think he was uh, very uh, prescient. But he also said, President Eisenhower, yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. This is what I, I, I'm calling the scientific bureaucratic complex. Now, uh, I would just like to sh uh, remind you of some of these people. We have President Obama here. Uh, now, President Obama has stated over and over and over again during the campaign and since becoming president that he wants to put science first. He wants to make uh, science the driver of public policy. Now, of course, what he's actually saying is he wants to put people like John Holdren in charge. And you see John Holdren there with the president. You also see Ralph Cicerone, the uh, head of the National Academy, another very political science, uh, politically oriented scientist, and John Holdren. They are at a podium there introducing the president of the United States. Uh, here's some other examples, Rajendra Pachari with Gore. Uh, uh, Jim Hansen, uh, 
throwing the earth up uh, in the air. Uh, and I, I have this bottom slide because I don't want you to forget Bob Watson, the former chairman of the IPCC. And next to him is James McCarthy. He's the guy who told the New York Times that he'd been to the North Pole and that, that it had melted. Um, now, all of these guys, I, I bring all this up because it's easy to sort of make fun of them. And so that's why I'm doing it, because it's easy. Um, these, it's not surprising that these scientists are uh, kind of bad apples. I mean, that they have, uh, they have a political agenda, and they are using science to drive that political agenda. And here's some more, and I bring these up because I, I think we shouldn't forget certain people. On the top there with Al Gore is Steven Schneider, who is really the brains behind this whole thing going back to the 1980s. On the bottom you have, on, uh, on uh, nearest to me, you have Michael Oppenheimer, now at Princeton University, uh, but of course at one time he was the Barbara Streisand Chair at the Nat Natural Resources Defense Council. And then uh, now uh, on the right there we have Jane Lubchenco giving a science demonstration uh, at a uh, House uh, committee hearing. I was actually there and I gotta say it, w it left me underwhelmed. Um, now, um, what I want to say is, uh, and this is something I want to throw out for your thought and consideration. I don't have a, a real conclusion or a, a, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, but I think um, uh, Paul Feuerabend, the, the famous philosopher of science who uh, in 1975 published Against Method, uh, Feuerabend was Viennese and he knew all the great scientists uh, in Vienna. Uh, and he eventually uh, studied uh, under Karl Popper at the LSE. He was going to study under Wittgenstein, who died in 1951 as he, as he moved to England. Uh, and he, um, he eventually became a professor at Berkeley, where he was for quite a long time. Foyer Robin uh, said uh, in his book, I think this is a very key thing, that you can, you can uh, I'll summarize this, you can really tell that a science is stagnant or it's going to stagnate when uh, one theory tries to drive all other theories out of the field. Uh, because you need multiple theories to uh, competing against one another, including uh, unscientific or pre-scientific theories, even uh, uh, religious theories, for example. Uh, and Foyer Robbins said, a method that encourages variety is also the only method that is compatible with a humanitarian outlook. Variety, and uh, I'll go back uh, earlier in the quote, variety of opinion is necessary for objective knowledge. Now, this uh, is, uh, think about this in relation to what we've got with the scientific bureaucratic complex. We have a bunch of authoritative institutions that, that uh, claim to be above politics and that claim to speak authoritatively to the public about what should be done on certain matters, like what kind of energy we should use and how much of it we should be using. Uh, Foyer Robin in Farewell to Reason said, the sciences of today are business enterprises run on business principles. Research in large institutes is not guided by truth and reason, but by the most rewarding fashion. And the great minds of today increasingly turn to where the money is. Well, I think, or where the power is. Yeah, I think you can see that he saw the scientific bureaucratic complex as well as Eisenhower did. Uh, I've, I've already said this, so I will skip it. Now, Foyer Robin published an essay where he called How to Defend Society Against, uh, How to Defend Society Against Science. He was not speaking of uh, what I consider corrupt scientists like Ralph Cicerone and uh, 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 John Holdren. He was talking about science as, as, as a good thing. I want to defend society and its inhabitants against all ideologies, science included. The most important consequence is that there must be a formal separation between state and science, just as there is now separation between state and church. Uh, I, I endorse that, but I don't know how to achieve it. Um, and he went on in this same essay, science may influence society, but only to the extent to which any political or other pressure group is permitted to influence society. Scientists may be consulted on important projects, but the final judgment must be left to the democratically elected consulting bodies. 
Now there, there is Foyer Robin. I thought you wanted to know he's, he was a man of, of uh, some, somewhat uh, uh, comic uh, aspect. Um, he, he, uh, I mean, he, he styled himself an anarchist, but I think in fact it was opposed because he wanted to shake things up. Um, now, one of the people who's done the most thinking about this is Dick Linson who published an essay two years ago. It's on archive. You can find it on the web. It's called Climate Science, Is It Currently Designed to Answer Questions? And it is a, it is a social, it is not a scientific study. It is a sociological analysis of the bureauc scientific bureaucratic complex in action and how these authoritative institutions like the National Academy are used to enforce orthodoxy, to drive other theories from the field, and to claim that, that science is, can, can guide public policy and should guide public policy, and it should tell elected representatives what they should be doing. For example, about how much energy we should be using and what kinds of energy we, we are permitted to use. Uh, I want to mention a couple of other things just for, your, for, for thinking about here. Aldous Huxley actually foresaw this in 1932. He wrote a book called Brave New World, which was a parody of a scientific utopia by H.G. Wells, the name of which I've forgotten. But Brave New World, of course, is now a very famous book. It was set in the year 632 AF, that is after Ford. Um, it is, uh, I think it is still worth reading in this regard and to think about what, uh, what the scientific establishment, uh, what, what the consequences of thinking that we should put science in charge of life really are, and this really goes back to Foyer Robbins' criticism. And finally, I would urge you to read or think about, if you have read it recently, The Third Voyage in Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift, which was first published in 1726, which actually uh, says a whole lot about uh, the current situation. And The Third Voyage is not the most popular because it's the most topical. That is, in 1726, you had the revolution in science, you had Newton, you had uh, all of these great people in, uh, in England, but uh, Swift actually foresaw a lot of it. And he, when he lands in uh, the, I want to quote here a couple of things because uh, I think you will find them uh, as, um, I think you will find them amusing. Um, he, he lands in, if you recall, Laputa, which is a flying island and it is over the land and it is moved around through magnetic forces by the people who live on this flying island. And uh, here's a description of, of things. And this is, uh, he calls scientists projectors. If you will recall, uh, people uh, in the early days of the scientific revolution had projects. They were projecting things, how, what things could be built, how things could be, and they were visionaries. And Swift did not think much of these projectors, even though, of course, some of them were very f famous scientists. Their houses are very ill-built, the walls bevel without one right angle in any apartment, and this defect ariseth from the contempt they bear to practical geometry, which they despise as vulgar and mechanic, those instructions they give being too refined for the intellectuals of their workmen, which occasions perpetual mistakes. And although they are dexterous enough upon a piece of paper in the management of the rule, the pencil, and the divider, yet in the common actions and behavior of life, I have not seen a more clumsy, awkward, and unhandy people, nor so slow and perplexed in their conceptions upon all other subjects except those of mathematics and music. They are very bad reasoners and vehemently given to opposition unless when they happen to be of the right opinion which is seldom their case. Now, uh, as he goes on, uh, uh, Swift uh, runs into um, what I, would, I think is an, an exact description of uh, our, the current state of global warming science. And I will uh, read, read this to you if I have time. Do I have time? I have three minutes. I have just time enough, um, if I can find it. Okay, thank you. I thought I had the, the page marked, but I, my uh, mark fell out. Let's check.
chapter 4. Yes, okay, here it is. No, I've lost it. Oh, yes, here it is. These people are under continual disquietudes, never enjoying a minute's peace of mind, and their disturbances proceed from causes which very little affect the rest of mortals. Their apprehensions arise from several changes they dread in the celestial bodies. These are the, pro the projectors, the scientists of the early 18th century. For instance, that the Earth, by the continual approaches of the sun towards it, must in course of time be absorbed or swallowed up, that the face of the sun will by degrees be encrusted with its own effluvia and give no more light to the world, that the earth very narrowly escaped a brush from the tail of the last comet, which would have infallibly reduced it to ashes, and that the next, which they have calculated for one in 30 years hence, will probably destroy us. For if in its perihelion it should approach within a certain degree of the sun, as by their calculations they have reason to dread, it will conceive a degree of heat 10,000 times more intense than that of red hot glowing iron, and in its absence from the sun carry a blazing trail, a blazing tail 10,014 miles long, through which if the earth should pass at the distance of 100,000 miles from the nucleus or main body of the comet, it must in its passage be set on fire and reduced to ashes that the sun daily spending its rays without any nutriment to supply them will at last be wholly consumed and annihilated, which must be attended with the destruction of the earth and of all the planets that receive their light from it. So you can see that even in the 18th century, science was already projecting these catastrophes out onto society and that science would be able to save and, and there's a lot more in, in, in the third voyage that uh, I'm summarizing here, that science would be able to save society if only scientists were put in charge. And this is what I am against and what I encourage you to think about, whether it's corrupt scientists or good scientists. There are a lot of good scientists who aren't part of the scientific bureaucratic complex, but I think it's almost of necessity that when scientists do become a part of it, these problems start to arise, and I think this is uh, where Foyer Robin is correct, that we need to protect society from science. And I just want to show you Jim Inhofe here to, to say that here's a guy who, who doesn't listen to the scientific bureaucratic complex, who understands that, uh, that uh, the science is important, but it's something that elected officials have to sort out and understand and not just take up the way Senator Barbara Boxer or John Kerry take it up and say, uh, or Al Gore and say, oh, the science is settled, now let's, uh, now let's just make the politicos do what they have to do because the scientists have spoken. Jim Inhofe has actually looked into it. He understands it, unlike any other member of Congress. And he said, well, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think that it's that big of a problem and we'll, we'll, let's, let's push these guys off a little bit and we'll, we'll, uh, deal with this issue the way it should be dealt with, which, which is politically rather than as a matter of scientific certitude. Thank you very much.